Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I've decided this morning when I woke up that I wanted to make some more friends. So I'm going to tell you why I think the Novus Ordo will disappear necessarily and why ultimately it's not the will of God. So buckle up for that if you're somebody who has a problem with that. Um, and we're going to get into not just my, you know, surfacey, superficial, rad trad opinions, but we're going to look at, I think, some pretty important theological concepts. And um, hopefully it makes sense. Now, also, it should be noted that um, this is not an indictment on any, any person. Um, the lay faithful are not responsible for the liturgical actions of hierarchs and the Pope. It's not, it's not your fault we're in a crisis in the church. Uh, if anyone takes this as, an, as a personal insult, then that's just their own problem. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. That's just sort of stop being so sensitive, if I could say it that way. And before we get to the meat of the argument, though, I'd like to say thank you to our first, well, to a sponsor that we've had for the first time. I'd like to present to you a new venture, which I'm really excited about. A gentleman reached out to me on Twitter and asked if I'd help him out with his product. And here we are. It's called Aura et Colora, Sacred Silhouettes, Echoes of Saints and Martyrs, A Journey in Color Through Sanctity and Sacrifice. Think about it like this. Look at this picture here. This is like a incredible traditional Catholic coloring experience. So what you have, for example, here is St. Alphonsus Liguori, and you can see the way the picture is laid out. Uh, you can color it in a way where sacred silhouettes, where it's going to look something like stained glass. And with all of the coloring that they have in this coloring book, you actually have uh, ex uh, d uh, descriptions, explanations. So for example, for St. Alphonsus here, an influential theologian and moral philosopher in the Catholic Church, born in eight, uh, 1696 in Naples, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and goes on to talk about parts of his life. You can find this in the link, uh, the, the link for this in the description of this video. And uh, if you just look at how beautiful the, the cover is on this thing here, uh, really great stuff. And uh, it is a Catholic business. And it's a startup by an individual who's trying to do something to provide Catholics with something awesome. So check the link in the description uh, box uh, for this video, this podcast, wherever you're watching or listening. And uh, thank you to Or et Calor. Okay, let's get into the heart of the show. So why am I saying this, you know, the, the new mass doesn't really fit, doesn't, doesn't, isn't up to snuff? Why am I saying that this liturgy itself, not just egregious demonstrations of it, but why the liturgy itself isn't actually going to last and why it ought to disappear? Well, before we even understand that, we've got to understand the purpose of the mass in and of itself. And here is just a quick overview of the four ends of mass. The first is adoration. Through the mass, we give God solemn worship, uh, praise, and honor. The second is thanksgiving. Through the Mass, we thank God for all he has bestowed. The third is propitiation. Through the Mass, the representation of the sacrifice of Christ upon Calvary, representation, not representation, uh, God's justice for the sins of mankind is satisfied. Petition, the fourth is petition. Through the Mass, we present God with our needs and ask for graces. So number one, we adore God. Number two, we, ought, we, ought, we give thanksgiving. Number three, we ask for the uh, prop propitiation for the sins of mankind. And uh, number four, we ask for our needs. So Catholics understand this. Mass is, for the, mass is offered for the forgiveness of sins. We go to Mass and we bring things to the Lord. When we go to Mass, we worship God in Mass and we adore Him and we give Him thanksgiving. This is why, you know, for example, Eucharistic adoration is an amazing thing, but it doesn't satisfy all the different ends of Mass. It's adoration. And we might, we give Thanksgiving and, and stuff, but it can't, that actual, we could probably fulfill three. We could give Thanksgiving, we could give adoration, and we could have our petitionary prayers, but we wouldn't be able to offer the sacrifice, okay? This is why Protestantism is, is unable to actually, um, is, is unable to worship God properly. It's impossible. And in fact, um, in a book that I have here, which I did a three-hour podcast on Outside the Church, There's No Salvation, I recommend you listen to it there. This is really just a long essay put together by a friend of mine named Mr. James Hanish. Uh, it's not in print. It's sort of a, you gotta, uh, you gotta be in the know to get the copy of this. And um, all non-Catholic worship, all heretical schismatic worship is actually hateful to God. It is displeasing to God. It is impossible for, it is impossible for a Protestant worship service to be pleasing to God. It offends God every single time it happens. The individual person, uh, you know, they may find their way to the truth through the imperfect nature of their Protestant sect, which is a heretical sect in which no one can be saved. Um, and that may happen, 
but the actual worship itself, the act of worship, is detestable and is an abomination. All non-Catholic worship, all schismatic, heretical, and, uh, and uh, non-Christian worship is an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. This is what the church has taught for many, many centuries. Sadly, many Catholics don't understand this today because it makes them squeamish because we're all about ecumenism and the spirit of Vatican II, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, so the four ends of mass must be reached. Must give adoration, thanksgiving, propitiation, and petition. So you have to ask yourself, is it possible that you could ever put together a liturgy that would fulfill those ends more or less than another liturgy. Of course it is. And even those who uh, are fans of the Novus Ordo, you must admit to yourself that the impetus for a massive reformation of the Mass, or restructuring, let's call it, the idea is that the Mass that preceded it didn't meet the needs of the people. Ultimately, the idea is that there was a deficiency. And this is where sometimes I'll get accused of things by Pope Splainer types, and they'll say things like, well, look, Kennedy, the Council of Trent says that uh, the church will never, uh, the Council of Trent says that, I think, whatever Canada is, 23, something like that. The Council of Trent says that, that the church will never produce a mass that is a cause for impiety. I'm paraphrasing. And they'll say, you're saying the new mass causes impiety. You're a heretic. Let you be anathema. I'm the YouTube magisterium. Look at me. Um, well, that's interesting. For one, piety is a technical religious term. Means uh, it, it talks about whether or not the mass will be offered as a valid sacrifice or not. But secondly, um, if you believe that the mass needed to change, then you believe that there was something that was not being fulfilled, objectively speaking, by the old mass, which means it was deficient. You can't escape this. Um, now, there's a big difference between massive restructuring and, let's say, organic development of the liturgy. The the refinement over time, okay? Those are different things. Of course, there's always been very, very, um, let's say, minute and precise refinements to the liturgy over thousands of years, but this wholesale change is completely unheard of that happened with the new Mass. So you got to keep these things in mind before we even talk about the liturgy. Does it meet the four ends? Is it part of the church's tradition? Well, ultimately, I will argue here, and again, please read Dr. Kwasniewski's book and Father Maudsley's book, if you can, a um, host of other books by, by Michael Davies are great to read as well. But I will argue here that the new mass isn't actually part of the sacred tradition. And it's also not really even the Roman rite. And that's because if it's not apostolic through the apostolic Roman tradition, if it's not part of that, then it can't be, naturally speaking, the Roman rite. At best, what we have is we have a mass that's sort of been grafted onto a tree and if you know anything about horticulture, you can do that the right way, or it causes the host to die. And you can make your decision about what's happened with the new mass over the last 50 or 60 years. But I want to just bring up here, um, real quickly, um, something from Dr. Kwasniewski speaking of his book. And here is a selection from, oopsie daisy, is a selection from um, his book, The uh, Once and Future Roman Right. This is a PDF copy. Um, in any case, so uh, this is a, a, on a chapter where he talks about sort of the laws that pertain to liturgy. And we're not going to go through all of those, but just real quickly, we're going to get to law number three, which pertains to what I'm trying to say here. So you can see here law number three, and I think that's big enough on the screen for everyone to read. And it says, law number three, the truth into which the Holy Spirit guides the church includes the development of her liturgy. So let's just pause there for a second. The claim here is, the truth into which the Holy Spirit guides a church includes the development of her liturgy. You've got to ask yourself, do you believe that? If you believe that, that's going to have consequences. And let's just think about that for a second. If the Holy Ghost is guiding the church, by the way, trads, you can say Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost. If you look in the Angelus Press Missal and some of the old prayers, it does say Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a, a trad, non-trad thing, although Holy Ghost is more common. I say it, but it's not like a, it's not like you're a modernist if you say Holy Spirit. Anyway, um, so uh, what was I saying? Okay, so if you believe that the Holy Ghost guides the church, then that must necessarily include the liturgy because where we have contact with the doctrine of the church played out 
where all Catholics have interaction with the essence of what the Church is here for, which is the salvation of our souls, which again, think of those four ends of Mass, including the propitiation of our sins. If that's the case, then that means the Holy Ghost must guide the liturgy. It's not as if the Holy Ghost guides the Church and says, make it up as you go along. So then you got to ask yourself, and Dr. Kwasniewski will illuminate this a bit for us, how can we know if something is of the Holy Ghost when it comes to liturgy and something is not of the Holy Ghost when it comes to liturgy? Well, because here's the problem. Many Catholics who are sympathetic towards tradition but ultimately fall into these neo-modernist traps, and I've heard this many times, they'll say things like, well, I get it, I prefer the traditional Mass, but you know, look at the Mass of, uh, I think St. Justin Martyr is one of them. You know, look at the Masses that were celebrated by some of these church fathers. And they seem to fit in some ways with the Novus Ordo. So how can you say the Novus Ordo is bad? Well, let's look about it this way. The Holy Ghost did not preserve those liturgies. The Holy Ghost did not preserve those liturgies. It's not that God's will changed, but let's just think for a moment here about the Old Testament. Because you could go even further. You could say, well, why don't we just do what they all did in the Old Testament? Why doesn't the mass look like it did in the, in the uh, temple? You know, we could keep going with this and say, well, if, if tradition just means something that's ancient, why don't we decide to do what's the oldest thing? Wouldn't that be more traditional? Many reasons why we don't do the Old Testament anymore. That's another conversation for another day. I'm just using it to illuminate a point. But one of those reasons is because the Holy Ghost did not preserve the Old Testament traditions. In fact, Christ came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. And there was a new covenant and the prefigurement of the Old Testament had filled its purpose. And there's a way to understand this if you want to explain this to your kids, if they ask, well, why was that something, a rule they had to follow back then and a rule I don't have to follow now? None of the divine laws, none of the divine commands, none of the moral laws, natural laws, et cetera, none of that ever change. What you do have is positive laws, even divine positive laws, but nonetheless positive laws that change uh, either through the guidance of the apostles, through the bishops and the pope and so on and so forth in the New Testament, or you have direct revelations to God through his prophets during the prefiguring time of the Old Testament leading up to the New Testament. And this is how this happens. I mean, if, ultimately, this is a matter of revelation. If you believe in God and you believe in the Creator and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, I mean, if you believe in the Trinity, you're going to have to accept some of these things based on revelation and faith. That's kind of as far as we can go with it. But there's a direct revelation to Moses, for example, where things are revealed that weren't revealed before. Christ comes to, you know, to, to, um, to bring this ultimately into fulfillment for us, okay, into its fullness. So, but here's a way to explain how this is possible with your kids. You say, listen, and I got this example from Gavin Ashenden. So if you're watching this, Gavin Ashenden, thank you for this wonderful example. I saw you talk about it on one of your shows. So if you have children, uh, you will give your children rules um, that they must follow when they're young, but not when they're older and rules that they must always follow. And this is the example that Gavin Ashton gave. And he said, he would tell his kids, when daddy, daddy says, you must always hold my hand when we cross the street, and you must never drink what is under the sink. Now, when you get older, you don't have to hold daddy's hand when you cross the street, but you must never drink what's under the sink. Some things are never permissible. Some things serve a purpose for the maturation or protection of a child. <clears throat> Excuse me. Something similar happens with the liturgical development in the church. So let's keep that in mind as we now look back to what Dr. Kwasniewski has to say regarding the development and the preservation of the liturgy by the Holy Ghost. Think to yourself if it's not preserved, then it's not the will of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, it would be preserved. Okay. Because also, also the word tradition means definitionally, especially in the religious sense, to pass something on, to guard something for safekeeping. That's what the word ultimately means. So the Holy Ghost will guard what is necessary. This is why Pope Francis's encyclical Guardians of Tradition is such a mockery. It's the opposite. It's, the Novus Ordo is not the guardian of tradition. And Pope Francis is, is he's, he's using this, he, he's, he's showing us his hand by using the opposite of the truth to sort of flip the argument on its head. But anyway, let's look at Dr. K. Dr. K goes on, and he says the following. Hence, any significant or wholesale rejection of elements that have come to be practiced and accepted over a long period of time, long period of time is important, in the church is, in a certain sense, 
a sin against the Holy Spirit. Big words. And any attempt to recast a right from the ground up cannot but reflect the false theology of the church and the Trinity. And he has a footnote here. Let's read this. And this is, he's, he's talking about an objection that will arise. And he says, to the objection, how can you say this about work endorsed by the popes? Good question. He replies, we are not privy to what certain popes were thinking or intending when they overthrew centuries of tradition, but we know very well what they did and the harm it has caused in ever widening waves. Were they aware that they were resisting the work of God, the Opus Dei, the outward signs of the inward dwelling of the Holy Spirit in the church? How could they not have been aware? And if they were emboldened by the ambiance of Ultramontanism, the Pope can do no wrong. His will is, his will is divine law, exempt from error, exempted from imprudence, etc. Or by the swaggering of aggiornamento, that's sort of, let's get with the times, that's what that means. Can we not say that they should have known better? The Pope is not, after all, Johnny from the local parish, who may not know, and perhaps has no duty to know, much about theology, scripture, canon law, or liturgy. And he continues, as part of this law, far, uh, Father, the extension, whoopsie daisy, oh, um, this is all the more apparent if we recall that the liturgy is the locus of divine revelation given by the Father, the extension through time and space of the incarnation of the Son, and the outpouring of the Spirit in the prayer of the Bride of Christ. So let's summarize that here. What he's saying is, the Holy Ghost preserving the liturgy. The Holy Ghost preserving the liturgy. This is clear when something is established as part of the life of Catholic, liturgical life of the church for a long, long time. So yes, do you find in the early centuries of the church, do you find different types of liturgies? Of course you do. But you find only preserved those which become part of the sacred apostolic tradition of the church. That's what you find. The ones that were left aside, they weren't evil. And they served a purpose, just like the laws you give your children when they're young. You have to hold their hand when you cross the street. But you can mature beyond that. And I want to just go back to something that Dr. K said here, which I think is important. Law number four, as the liturgy develops, it becomes fuller and more perfect both as an expression of the mysteries of faith and as a vehicle for inculcating appropriate virtues in the faithful and for eliciting from them the acts of faith, hope, and charity that are demanded by the mysteries. If you might allow me here to sort of philosophize for a moment. You know, I recommend everybody should read the book Confessions by St. Augustine. And in fact, if you do like audiobooks, it is available. I just recorded Anthony Esselin's recent translation for Tan. You can find that on Audible, Scribed, or I guess it's called Everin now, but any of those places, maybe Spotify, I don't know. All the places that have audiobooks. And one of the things you realize when you understand the church's philosophical and theological tradition, especially as, as illuminated by Augustine and then perfected by Aquinas, is that there are degrees of being. What does that mean? Well, you, you could say it like this, God exists more than we exist. You might think to yourself, how does that work? Well, God's existence is not dependent on anyone. He's self-exist, self-sustaining. Therefore, he's immutable, which means unchanging, which means there is no, there can be no uh, corruption in God. He is existence in its full, purest sense. We, however, exist in relation to the sustainer who keeps us in existence. And therefore, we actually don't possess in ourselves the perfection of full existence. We understand this concept when we look at the traditional sacred architecture in the church. Although it is true that historically in places like mission territory, there would be wooden churches that would be built. Over time, you will find that if those places last, they will build a stone church on the same property or they'll bolster that church with stones or cement or concrete over time to make sure it lasts forever. In fact, you can't actually consecrate an altar in a Catholic church unless that altar is essentially made of stone and attached to the ground. And why is that? Because something that is the house of God and is consecrated in a very special way must be permanent. The liturgy is the same. 
We understand, well, actually, let me add one more thing. Also within the Latin and Eastern traditions, we have two different ways of talking about the beatific vision, union with God. And the East still use this term uh, theosis. Essentially, if I'm getting that wrong, please don't, but I believe that's a term. So I'm speaking off the cuff here. But essentially, uh, it's a type of becoming God. Now, not becoming God in the pantheistic sense, but when you talk to Eastern Catholic priests and things like that, they'll actually say things like, we become God in the beatific vision. It doesn't mean we would go and become one with God in the pantheistic Hindu sense where Atman becomes part of Brahman, but we become God insofar as our nature unites itself to God's nature to the point where there is a, a, a unified relationship where it's as if we actually are divinized ourselves. Okay. Um, and this is why pantheistic religions are so dangerous is because they can play on this and bring us into some weird places, which are heretical. In the West, we wouldn't necessarily talk about that in the same way. Instead, we would use a term, uh, we would say we, be, we possess God. And what does it mean to possess God? How can we possess God if God sustains us and possesses us? How can we possess him? Well, this is only possible through the incarnation. Uh, God condescends himself. St. Augustine goes over this. Again, I recommend his confessions. And he goes over how, you know, how can it be that God can dwell in my soul when the world is not big enough to dwell for God to dwell in it? You know, or how is it that I dwell in God and he dwells in me? This is a mystery. And th that's too much for us to go into here. But these are the terms that we use. So if we become God, become like God, if we uh, possess God, where we have this sharing, this fraternity, this, this relationship with God, this union with God, which is fulfilled in the beatific vision, then the things that are on earth that are divine, and remember, what did they call the mass? In the East, they call it the divine liturgy. Okay, The things that are on earth that are divine must in the best way possible, in order to be pleasing to God, they must present and possess the attributes that are divine. They must be beautiful. They must be unchanging. They must be clear. There is no ambiguity in God. They must be represent. They must be a representation of the divine power. And what is that divine power with, with regards to liturgy? Well, of course, there's the the, the holy sacrament, but also. Christ, who is God, says to the apostles, I give you, I'm paraphrasing, I give you my power. The apostles, the apostles possess this power to bind and loose and so on and so forth. They are the, the Pope is the, the prime minister, if that makes sense, and the, and the apostles possess the, the power of the office that is, that is only possible through apostolic succession. For liturgy to be apostolic, and to be part of the divine apostolic tradition, it must contain those characteristics. Otherwise, it falls short. We can't avoid this. So when we look to the Novus Ordo, we get to a position where we realize it just doesn't possess these characteristics. And the only way that you can argue against that really is to fall into certain errors. And one of the errors, and this plays off of the idea of what's true in false tradition, one of the errors is that, well, if you really want tradition, go back to the early church. Well, again, we've kind of been over this. Um, it's not, tradition is not about a certain place in time. Tradition does not mean old. Tradition means preserved. Uh, Pope St. Pi, or not Pope St. Pope Pius XII, he's not canonized. Pope Pius XII, in his um, encyclicals, Mediator Dei, uh, Humana Generis, etc., he actually talks about this false antiquarianism. And what is this false antiquarianism? It means going back to the beginning to justify the changes you're doing now. If we believe that the church has been guided by the Holy Ghost for centuries, millennia, then we must believe that the Holy Ghost has guided the church well. And, and this is what's so fascinating about these arguments by these sort of neo-modernist commentators of our day who try to do apologetics for the Novus Ordo. They're implicitly, not explicitly always, implicitly indicting the church of 20 centuries and basically saying, you know, well, we needed this change. Well, why do we need this change? Well, because that liturgy wasn't up to snuff or whatever. Um, well, if that's the case, that's a 
pretty strong indictment against the Holy Ghost that he sort of was on vacation for 20 centuries. Or you have to believe that what is the long-standing will of God in the church somehow magically changes overnight, which doesn't really fit the attributes of God, does it? Because we God know that God's will is unchanging. If there is any change in what's expected of us, again, these are little things like, you don't have to hold my hand when we cross the street, but you still must never drink what's under the sink. And we have we found that already fulfilled. We find by the 4th, 5th, 6th century that these sort of uh, liturgies of the uh, infancy of the church, these are refined, and those which are to be preserved are preserved, and those which are to be cast away are cast aside. We see this played out. So ultimately, the Novus Ordo, the Novus Ordo cannot fit. It cannot be part of sacred tradition because it's not preserved as part of sacred tradition. It cannot be apostolic because you can't trace the, the Novus Ordo to any apostle. And it therefore can't really even be the Roman rite. Uh, it can't be of the Roman rite. It's the, it's the use, it's a missile promulgated by the Pope. That's a whole other conversation. Yes, but it can't really be the Roman rite because it's not actually Roman if you understand what I mean by that. So what is it? Well, Archbishop Lefebvre, he would use a term that makes everybody upset when they don't speak French, and he would call it a bastard rite. Whoa, that sounds very offensive, but uh, bastard in French is not used the same way as an insult as in English, maybe here and there, but it's not. Like, if you call somebody a bastard in English, it's like, you know, it's like offending their mother, you know. It's, an, it's a technical term. It means, it means a child who is an orphan. It means a child who doesn't have a father. That's what it means. And this word was used much more frequently in the past. It wasn't as politically correct. Um, the Nova Sordo is a bastard rite. It doesn't have a fatherly origin because it doesn't find itself in the apostles and it doesn't find itself preserved by the Holy Trinity over 20 centuries. It just comes out of nowhere. For all of these reasons, the Nova Sordo it can't last because it's not the positive will of God. And we also know that it just simply can't last based on numbers. There's not a single place on earth where the Novus Ordo is the predominant liturgy, where they are thriving. And people will point to Africa. Africa is starting to have signs of decay. And you, you have to look beyond. So you have to understand, in Africa, it is a place that is extremely conservative in its religiosity. Everyone is either a Protestant or a Muslim or a Catholic in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially. And in those places, no one's an atheist. Everyone goes to church. Also, Christians are heavily persecuted. So even if you have a deficient liturgy, when you're persecuted, you hold fast to the faith. Although in places that were predominantly Catholic, that were sort of French and Belgian colonies, for example, many of those places, the Nova Sordo, uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church has actually been taken over and usurped by the Protestants. And you have to look at Sp uh, Latin America as well. Um, Latin America is the Protestant Church, especially in places like Brazil, historically Catholic, uh, you know, havens. The, the Protestant churches are exploding and people are leaving the Novus Ordo. Why? Well, because the Novus Ordo imbibes in them a Protestant spirit, but it doesn't do Protestantism as well as the Protestants. Um, and you also, if people are going to say, well, because there are certain places in Africa where the Novus Ordo is doing well, therefore it must be God's will. Well, there are many places where the, the Islam and the Protestant churches are doing well. So is that also God's will? You've got to be a little bit more sophisticated than that when you're talking about these things. And for all the reasons I've talked about, whether or not there's a blip on the radar here and there, this is the exception that proves the rule. Take a look at Europe. Take a look at Latin America. Take a look at Quebec, which was the strongest Catholic culture in the world until 60 years ago, basically. And the mass changes and everybody leaves. And it's not the only reason, but it's a, it's a major reason. So for these and all the reasons I've described, we must admit that the Novus Ordo, it must disappear. It must disappear. And it must go away, and it will. Demographically, it will be gone. And it is not something that is part of the sacred tradition given to us by the apostles and preserved by the Holy Ghost. Again, this is not an indictment on any single person, but this is just, these are the facts, as they say. All right, as always, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.